So good evening to everybody, ladies and gentlemen. We are already 13 participants, therefore I shall don't to lose time and we will start right now. Dear colleagues, welcome to an event organized by the Forum for Historical Research on Belarus. This discussion will be held in Belarusian and English and will be translated simultaneously by Veronika Mazokiewicz and Ales Lavinets. Languages can be selecting used using the globe icon on the bottom bar of the screen. Instructions you can find also in the chat. One important note, this event will be recorded and published on the DGO YouTube channel. We meet here on the anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster to discuss the consequences of the war in Ukraine. According to the German Chancellor Scholz, Europe has again entered a turning point. Therefore, allow me to briefly outline the concern of our working group. The Forum for Belarusian Historical Research continues the activity of the Belarusian German Historical Commission, which stopped its work last summer. What we tried to do before the white red white revolution was to initiate a bilateral dialogue following the example of the German Russian and the German Ukrainian historical commissions. From the very beginning, our goal was to involve independent colleagues in the work. Because of the corona epidemic, the commission never appeared in public. Instead, the number of historians who suffered repression increased. Due to the war in Ukraine, the dialogue can only be conducted with colleagues in immigration. When we met with representatives of the Academy of Sciences and Universities two years ago, it was already apparent that the politics of history would play an enormous role. At that time, however, no one suspected that we were facing a revolution and a war. While the German side in an idealistic manner put the traditions of freedom of teaching and research on the agenda, the Belarusian side in a theological manner defended the principle of historicism. Today, the weapons speak and the historians are called upon in the struggle for historical truths. Due to the power of discourse, the relationship between nation and empire is once again coming to the fore. Nolan Wolens, historians follow the geopolitical thought pattern dictated by Putin. From my point of view, Belarus specialists would be better advised to follow the German president Steinmeier, who initiated the historical commission during his visit to Minsk in 2018. The idea is to free the country from the shadow of the Soviet Union by focusing on the history of society. The Forum for Historical Belarus research reformulated itself at an informal meeting in Berlin at the end of March and agreed on the following tasks. Online discussions, research fellowships, a summer school, and a conference on the experience of dictatorship in the 20th century. Alessia belanovic pates coordinates the activities of the forum within the framework of the German Association 
for East European studies. And together with Lisa Vieta, Wunderwald was making this discussion possible. Thank you very much. For the organization of today's debate, we have to thank Alexander Friedman, who is co-investigator of a research project of Humboldt University in Berlin. I wish us all an exciting and insightful evening. Hereby, I hand over the moderation to Alexander. Good evening, dear friends, dear colleagues. Thank you for uh, your uh, your introduction, dear Professor Born. Uh, not uh, in order not to lose the time, we will switch to the discussion. These issues are very important. Uh, they are difficult but important. And my first question that I would like to ask uh, will be to Alice Pashkevich, uh, the Belarusian historian. Uh, uh, well, and uh, this is uh, a question uh, how the war uh, is perceived in uh, uh, Belarus, war against Ukraine. Well, I would like to um, uh, also underline that uh, today the results of opinion poll uh, organized by uh, Andrei Vardamatsky Laboratory uh, show that 43% uh, percent of uh, uh, respondents, uh, so uh, th there was uh, uh, well a sample of 1,000 uh, persons uh, um, interviewed by fall so 43 so percent of uh, uh, the respondents uh, support uh, the uh, the uh, Russian operation and war well, in Ukraine and uh, the uh, opinion was taken before the events and uh, uh, revelation about what happened in Bucha so but mo most uh, of those uh, um, uh, uh, of those who participated, polled, uh, 45 uh, have compassion with Ukraine, but uh, among those, uh, 25 uh, ha um, have both, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, compassion with Ukraine and Russia. So, uh, uh, do do you think, Alice, do you think that uh, um, uh, this war is perceived in such way? What are your perceptions? So, the results uh, presented by Professor Vardamatsky, uh, they show that uh, I, uh, well, I would agree with these results. Uh, I have this same feeling, same perception, that uh, while there is a split in the Belarusian society, uh, well, 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 uh, I myself, uh, uh, as many of my uh, active colleagues uh, outside Belarus, so I don't have uh, direct contact with uh, regular people, with ordinary people who do not belong to our to our networks, uh, to our environment. So uh, those who share the same views. So. Uh, how, I, from my personal experience, I can uh, tell you uh, directly. But uh, uh, while well, uh, taking uh, the experience of the 2014, uh, uh, when there was the first stage of the Russia's war against Ukraine, when the uh, Crimea was an extent, uh, the hostilities in Donbas started, well, when this war was uh, well uh, uh, was an object uh, well, focus from the Belarusian society at that that time. Well, uh, well, uh, in democratic uh, uh, environment, we 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 have the same views. But in 2014, 2015, uh, Ukraine was in focus on our attention. So. Uh, so it was largely discussed and we didn't have an active political life at that time and it was uh, uh, well as the first plan was uh, uh, really uh, ukrainian events well we have uh, can also recall this experience uh, how the society was split 
at that time, there was such situations that almost all independent media, they have somehow pro-Ukrainian position and were retaliating these views. Those who uh, used the independent media as the information source were mostly for Ukraine. They accepted more or less Ukrainian agenda and rejected the Russian agenda. Those who watched the TV, state TV, uh, were uh, to uh, some extent uh, in one way or another were for the Russian aggression and shared the Russian viewpoint on this conflict. And, uh, and the, the nuances depended on the uh, well, uh, level of support. So how, uh, how Ukraine was perceived uh, and uh, well, there, there were well many people who shared the Russian position, but were still um, more moderate. Well, from this experience, I think we have the same experience uh, situation now in Belarus. So those who have uh, uh, who have TV as the main uh, information so source, uh, well, Belarusian TV or the Russian TV. Well, uh, at that. Uh, uh, at the, at that time, maybe there were dif uh, differences, but now there are no differences. While they present uh, TVs, uh, both Bel from Belarus and Russia present the same uh, point. Uh, so those who watch these TV, they uh, share the Russian uh, position, Russian viewpoint, and they have sympathy towards Russia. Those who are, those who are, uh, who su are supporters of Ukraine, uh, and those who uh, take information from uh, independent me uh, media, from social networks, from independent uh, telegram channels, uh, uh, non-state channels, uh, they share the Ukrainian positions. Uh, another thing, what is different, while well, the information landscape uh, compared to 2014 changed the, uh, drastically in 2020, well, where uh, there was an aborted uh, attempt of a revolution, while there were uh, active protests against uh, Lukashenko's rule, uh, so uh, following the rigged elections, and uh, the protests that followed, uh, uh, multi-thousand uh, participants, uh, and uh, protests that uh, lasted for several months. So, uh, uh, and uh, uh, there are people who uh, became refugees who had to leave Belarus, so they became subscribers uh, to different uh, Telegram channels. And it is very important for, uh, and, and this is a, 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 a turning point for the consciousness of these people. So the state uh, television in 2020 was losing the game, the, uh, the game, but and and to the Russian TV was uh, also lagging behind because it was not a Belarusian national agenda. So the. Well, uh, to find uh, information about Belarus, one should uh, be looking for uh, more local media outlets. We also know what happened uh, uh, over the, the last two years with the purges, with uh, this purge of all independent uh, media and the public space. Uh, the Belarusian media suffered a lot. We know what were the methods they were uh, recognized as extremists uh, and uh, first uh, with extremist content then as extremist uh, uh, formations and at the end uh, they were considered as terrorist organizations and uh, even if it is not stated in the law uh, uh, well they they well, uh, the uh, fact, uh, the way how they receive information is uh, being uh, to some extent uh, criminalized, and many journalists uh, spent uh, uh, days and nights in uh, prisons, uh, and uh, also from uh, regular citizens, they take off uh, phones and they check whether people uh, is uh, subscribed or not to independent uh, uh, Telegram channels. Uh, so. Uh, 
the main uh, uh, sources of uh, independent information uh, were squeezed out of Belarus. And uh, uh, many active people also left. And uh, there is uh, a problem uh, about uh, with information. Well, so uh, those people, we know that uh, it is not uh, forbidden. So people continue to read uh, independent uh, uh, news outlets and they are subscribers or readers of the independent media. So, and uh, also blocked uh, websites are being uh, visited uh, using uh, VPN. So people who are looking for information can receive information, but it, it, it's become uh, more difficult uh, by using, for example, VPN. And it is also not uh, less secure. Uh, so uh, only those who are there convinced, uh, uh, well, the, Looking at those who are uh, 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 who, who are opponents, uh, active opponents of Lukashenko and uh, opponents of democratic, uh, well, uh, and uh, supporters of democratic change, they look for uh, in independent information sources. At at the same uh, time, uh, if uh, forty percent of uh, audience accept the uh, Russian agenda, so they uh, get information from this. Uh, 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 Russian uh, agenda, and these figures, 40%, are not so huge. So, we, uh, if we, with such a level of terror and uh, of the state terror uh, uh, in Belarus, if uh, there is a minority still, the uh, smaller part uh, uh, follows these propagandist uh, uh, formulas. This is a good indicator. So the uh, war in Ukraine has a uh, difficult, uh, different impact on Belarusians. And uh, I think that uh, some uh, some moods, if not protest moods, but uh, the non-acceptance of uh, this propaganda still is there. And, and uh, it uh, concerns also the events in Ukraine. And uh, I would like also to underline that uh, they show a a general. Uh, this polls show a general figure, and uh, if uh, we take these figures uh, uh, without detailization, because they can show a different thing. So, uh, well, we have a much lesser uh, percent of those uh, percent of those percentage of those who are uh, for the uh, war uh, compared to Russia. And m m m many uh, studies in Russia show that uh, 70 to up to 70, up to 80 percent of Russians are for the war. We have a much lower figure, and one should also take into account the emotional attitude, the emotional attitude to this war. When uh, uh, a person is uh, watching the Russian propagandist uh, channels and uh, programs and does not have an alternative uh, uh, information source or approach, well, yes, uh, the person might have an impression that, yes, something is wrong in Ukraine. So Russia had to uh, uh, launch this operation. Russia, uh, Russia didn't want to do it, but uh, so they accept. So we have the situation that the, that uh, despite all that, 45% of the of uh, of Belarusians uh, are with Ukraine. They and uh, we're talking about uh, this uh, uh, this situation, uh, international situation. When uh, you look at uh, uh, American, German, French press, uh, there is not no much attention to Belarus. Well. There's some information uh, about Belarusian volunteers who uh, fight on the Ukrainian side. The, there are some uh, statements of the Belarusian uh, uh, democrat, uh, democratic uh, politicians. Uh, there were some publications about uh, uh, Lukashenko's statements, but not so much. So, uh, but uh, uh, how the role of Belarus is being perceived uh, in this war? So, 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 
so how Belarus is presented from this point of view? What are the uh, 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 what are the uh, how Belarus is being perceived in the West and uh, how they uh, um, uh, how this war is perceived? Uh, question is to Annika and to, to David. Do you want me to start, David? Or... Okay. Um, good evening, everyone, uh, first of all. Um, <clears throat> and I want to preface uh, my comments by saying that I, I think I was invited as a faculty member of Washington University in St. Louis in the United States, but I've actually been in Germany since January. So what I'm gonna say, I think is much more focusing on uh, the German perspective um, on, on the war in Belarus, because that's the environment I'm currently traveling in and um, I think understand better than what is um, discussed in North America. Although of course, to some extent I, can't say a few words about that, but I'm going to leave that mostly to David, um, because I think that might be a good uh, division of labor. Um, so first of all, the, the perception of the war in Ukraine, um, it's, it's again something I can say very little um, about because I'm not there. Um, but from what I understand uh, from the media reports that are um, accessible, um, it seems to me that the original or initial kind of turn against uh, Belarusians as charging them as co-aggressors uh, with uh, Russia um, has, has given way to, I think, a more nuanced view um, of Belarus, um, where I think the Ukrainian population um, and the government, um, Zelensky, I think, was very clear about that, um, is, is very clear in saying uh, we understand that this is the government um, who has made the decision to support Russian troops um, in, in their attack on Ukraine. Um, but on the other hand, are more sympathetic toward the Belarusian population um, and see that many, um, if not most, Belarusians are actually very critical um, and against the war. Um, so I, I think that there's a, a split uh, perception um, of Belarus uh, from the Ukrainian perspective, but maybe there's some members in the audience that can actually speak better to that uh, in the Q&A afterwards. Um, and I think to some extent that more differentiated perception um, really was supported by the discovery that several Belarusians were actively sabotaging Russian uh, troop transportations um, along Russian and uh, Belarusian railroads. Um, I think that um, really changed from my perception the, um, the discussion. From the German perspective, um, I would say that there's actually very little conversation about Belarus um, apart from uh, the fact that Belarus is basically a staging ground uh, for the Russian military for the assault um, on Ukraine. Um, but for the most part, uh, Lukashenko is, is seen much more as a, a puppet um, of, of Moscow, of, of Putin, um, with very little room, but also, I think, desire for, for self-initiative. Uh, um, from my reading of, of the German media, I think there's actually a little bit more of a an attempt to make fun of Lukashenko and his pandering toward uh, Putin and trying to kind of remain uh, friends with him. Um, so in, in essence, Belarus as a sovereign state, as a sovereign actor is basically non-existent um, in the portrayal of the war on Ukraine, um, other than again, as more the staging ground for the military operations. Um, and in that case, um, I think there's three moments in which that really um, comes out in media portrayals. For one, of course, the discussion of the so-called exercises, maneuvers uh, that I think really were just a ruse for pre pre preparing uh, the assault on Ukraine in February. Um, the second moment was the reports of uh, loot of stolen goods from Ukraine. Uh, that were shipped home from, from Belarus uh, by, by Russian soldiers. Um, and then the third moment in which Belarus, I think, really shows up as a, as a central part of the military strategy um, is in the discussion of uh, the strategy of, of NATO and how NATO should respond to uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, and that discussion, of course, is very much informed by the fear um, and I think also risk of, of spillover um, moments, uh, meaning rockets that might jump across the border into Poland, into Romania. I think we've heard from the explosions in, in Transnistria today, which um, from what I was able to find out today, um, is somewhat unclear what actually happened there. 
Um, but of course, the arrival of um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees uh, in Europe uh, directly implicates uh, members um, of NATO. Um, and, that, and that whole discussion about um, the NATO, uh, NATO's necessary response, I think troop movements within Belarus are analyzed as a potential threat. Um, and so I think this is where Belarus very concretely um, inflects um, what um, may members of, of NATO might do, um, because that, of course, directly implicates the, the, the line of, of contact between members of NATO uh, from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. Um, and so here the discussion, I think, is, is, is mostly focusing on Poland um, and the situation in Poland, um, how that might be uh, responding to developments in Belarus. Um, and the discussion I've been following primarily here um, is uh, Poland's desire to relocate some of the nuclear weapons uh, from, from German military bases um, or from American bases in Germany, um, where there has been for a long time a discussion to remove uh, the nuclear weapon arsenal um, to move those to Poland um, to create kind of a line of defense. Um, but and on the other hand, of course, with the uh, recent referendum in Belarus, um, we have to risk that Russian nuclear weapons will be um, stationed in Belarus. And then you would have a direct line of contact between two states <clears throat> that have nuclear weapons at their disposal. Um, and that, in essence, is actually worse and a more dramatic situation than we had during the Cold War, where you had multiple buffer states uh, that were free of nuclear weapons. Uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and I think that would be a moment when Belarus as a party, as an agent in the war uh, would become much more prominent and much more central um, in the discussion. Um, yeah, I think these are the, the, the few moments I wanted to pull out here, um, thinking more about the geopolitical implications uh, and how they're being discussed in the perception of the war of Ukraine. I guess I can I can follow on from that, and um, it's interesting uh, that I'm talking about this topic because it's actually not something I would normally discuss. Uh, most of the time, I get asked about the situation inside Belarus or inside Ukraine, rather than the situation in North America. And I think probably the U.S. perspective is more familiar from, let's say, global media, social media and the frequent uh, statements of various participants, uh, Anthony Blinken, for example, the most recent meeting with Zelensky. If I can focus briefly then on situation in Canada, which may be slightly different. Um, in 2020, for the first time in my living memory, Belarus made news headlines in Canada. And that was something unique, uh, made every single major radio station, and I would say universally sympathetic with the protests against uh, the Lukashenko uh, fabricated election results and what happened afterwards, the repressions that followed. And they were very closely monitored, I would say, uh, by a number of news outlets from around August 2020 to approximately December. After December, I would say there was virtually nothing in the Canadian media anymore, and, and it began to focus on other topics. If one looks at Canada as well, the Ukrainian diaspora has actually disproportionate influence given its size. It's very large on the prairie provinces and in cities like Winnipeg and my own city of Edmonton. But on a Canadian national level, um, I would say the Ukrainian community exerts tremendous influence on government policy. And it's done that with the government of Stephen Harper, but oddly even more so under the liberal government of Justin Trudeau in that his first foreign minister and now the deputy prime minister was a Ukrainian or is a Ukrainian Canadian, uh, Christia Freeland. And she, I think, has led the sort of... Um, denunciations in Canada about Russia's attack. And incidentally, the Ukrainian-Canadian perspective on Zelensky was universally negative. 
uh, from 2019 until earlier this year. He was regarded as an almost comical figure, ridiculed in various um, social media, media, you could say editorials as well. Um, Poroshenko, on the other hand, is almost a free reign in Canada among the community. He comes here often and his perspective is heard. And it's only over the last couple of months that Zelensky has now been taken up as a hero figure uh, among Ukrainian Canadians and therefore of Canadians generally, uh, are very positive towards him. And this, of course, you know, reflects his standing in Ukraine and the United States. He's actually, I saw a poll a couple of days ago, which suggests Zelensky is the most popular statesperson in the world in the United States, which is quite remarkable in, in my opinion, uh, far above Biden and uh, Trump and other figures. So uh, the Ukrainian figures are put forward. And I would say Belarus has kind of been lumped into um, the Russian sphere without really any discrimination, without any attempt to look at things like the, the uh, Belarusian volunteers or the anti-war movement that Sikhanovskaya recently launched. Uh, that has not made any kind of impact whatsoever on this side of the water. So you could say that the perspective here is 100% behind Ukraine, but it also puts Belarus very much in the, in the Russian sphere. Um, there is, of course, some knowledge that Lukashenko doesn't really represent Belarus, but the fact is, uh, de facto, he's the one making the decisions. He's the one sitting there in the presidential palace and meeting with Putin and, uh, and other leaders. And just as Annika said about Europe, it's very much the same, I think, in North America, that Belarus has not got a voice. And this, I think, is quite tragic because Belarusian students, for example, are now getting um, banned from universities here, whereas Ukrainian students are being given uh, all kinds of subsidies. Um, they're allowed to come here, free accommodation is found for them, families are volunteering to, to give them free accommodation. Uh, whereas Belarus is regarded in the same, the same as Russia, that their students, even though many of them left the country, fled from the dictatorship of Lukashenko, they are simply being treated as fellow fellows of the Russians. Uh, whether the Russian students should be treated in that way has also been debated quite widely here. Um, but at the moment, I would say both scholars and students from Russia are not going to be accepted. And I have some personal experience with that from a recent decision we made to accept a research fellow from Moscow. Um, we had to stop that. Um, but Belarus is very much put into the same boat. It's ignorance, really, I think, and a lack of information, uh, really accurate information about Belarus, whereas the Ukrainian diaspora, uh, had, there are Ukrainian institutes in virtually every province of Canada. The biggest one is here in, in Edmonton, and it's been there since the 1970s. Similarly, the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute was set up, I think, just before the one here, and that also has um, a strong influence on the American public as well. So Belarus is very much being left out of this, this equation. So I'll, I'll stop at that for now, Alexander. Many thanks. We will continue with um, our next uh, question, which uh, concerns Belarus. Yesterday, uh, uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska gave an interview to a uh, German TV, uh, and in the, her interview, uh, she repeated the same uh, thesis that she uses from the beginning of the war, that the fate of Belarus today is being uh, decided in Ukraine. The fate of Belarus, the future of Belarus depends upon what uh, would happen in Ukraine, whether Ukraine would be able to win in this war and to stop the Russian aggression. What does this war mean for Belarus? And this is a question to all participants. Well, uh, I will start the first to answer this question. When uh, we talk uh, about uh, this thesis, uh, st uh, the point of Svetlana Tikhanovska, and uh, it was not only she. From this point of view, uh, I do agree that today 
the, in Ukraine, the issue is not only about Ukraine's future, but also about Belarus's future. We know what is happening in Belarus. Well, the civil society is uh, in a, a kind of organized uh, view, uh, is almost uh, squeezed out of the country or destroyed or in, a uh, in uh, uh, well, uh, now in a kind of clandestinity. So uh, it's almost impossible to do uh, anything and taking into account uh, the results of opinion polls uh, that nevertheless, the, uh, what is obvious, there is a potential for discontent of those who are uh, discontent. So, so the potential for changes in Belarus exists, internal potential. Well, but uh, well, it could not uh, go uh, grow importantly uh, internally. But there is an external uh, uh, an external environment. So, so uh, Lukashenko uh, uh, stayed in power because he support uh, he received the political financial support from Russia. It uh, uh, impacted the the mood. Uh, both of protesters, but also on his uh, um, entourage. So the people from the law enforcement agencies saw that uh, Moscow is behind Lukashenko. At this moment, at this moment what is important, uh, this war um, weakens Russia and weakens positions of Russia. And we, uh, well, it's difficult to, to um, make prognosis and anticipate. We don't know which processes would uh, be in Russia. What are the uh, perceptions and feelings of uh, uh, Russian, uh, generally Russians? But one might uh, suppose that uh, the defeat in this, uh, in this uh, war uh, might provoke in Russia st strong problems and strong discontent and uh, uh, against the regime that would lead to some changes. Russia would uh, uh, weaken, be, be, become weaker, and uh, it would open uh, window opportunities for Belarus. And we, uh, as this community that uh, protested in 2020, in this fight we are entirely for Ukraine, and uh, and uh, Tikhanovska uh, states not only her own position, but uh, they, she represents uh, the position of the democratic forces. And uh, uh, this position uh, is not uh, entirely marginal, uh, uh, not marginal at all, uh, at all uh, uh, within the Belarusian society. So, uh, the, the, the many things uh, depends upon the outcome of the war uh, Russia against Ukraine. Should I just continue, or? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think I think in many ways it will also really depend on what happens in the next weeks, next few weeks, and or, or coming months. Um, hopefully not years. Um, how how the war will play out uh, in terms of what um, is going to happen in Belarus. Um, but for for tonight, I think I want to highlight two moments here. Um, what does the war mean for Belarus? Um, I think on one hand, um, and David already talked about that. I mentioned that already. Um, is that I think there is uh, much less interest in what has actually happened within Belarus, um, especially with regard to just the widespread support for the opposition, for protesters that we had seen um, since uh, 2020. Um, I, I also would say that um, that lost, um, lost kind of momentum over the last year, um, but with the beginning of the war, I think that's really disappeared from, from public attention and public awareness. Um, in the same way that uh, the attempts of refugees that were that are basically trapped in Belarus and that are trying to um, enter Poland, um, that that has also basically disappeared um, as a moment of concern <clears throat> for most members of the public. Um, where on the other hand, I was just really looking up um, the numbers recently. Um, since the beginning of this year alone, more than 4,000 refugees have been turned away by the Polish border guard and pushed back into Belarus. Um, and that is of course an issue that <clears throat> I think is, 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 is dramatic and tragic um, and um, just continues uh, human rights violations within Belarus, um, but that has largely disappeared behind the widespread support for refugees from Ukraine, which, which is 
the support that has to be given. But I think on the other hand, um, that issue is um, lost uh, traction. Um, on the other hand, for, for Belarus um, internally, of course, I think we see a much greater dependency from Russia and a loss of sovereignty that we've already mentioned. Um, and also, I think a, a new wave, an increasing wave of arrests um, and of a repression uh, within Belarus against journalists, um, against very recently a number of trade uh, union members, um, the independent trade unions, uh, more than 20 people were arrested, uh, medical professionals, um, there was a trial uh, against bus conductors for corruption. Um, to me, it seems like there's... Um, the beginning of, of, of an economic crisis, of a deep, deep, deep economic crisis as a result of the sanctions. Um, and uh, to me, it seems like the government is trying to quell or prevent any kind of dissent, articulation of dissent and protest against that crisis um, by, by cracking down on anybody who, who might articulate uh, critical voices. Um, and on the other hand, and I think Alice um, already indicated that as well, um, is that there's, of course, discontent within Belarus um, about the war. Um, and um, it, it seems to me that, that Lukashenko is afraid that that discontent, that that criticism will actually turn against him. Um, and so there's another incentive, if, if you will, for him um, or his, his supporters to, to crack down on possible um, protesters um, and, and opposition members and so I think they're uh, incre increasing um, and, and more radicalizing a wave of repression in the form of new arrests, um, the conduction of more and more trials. Most of them are closed, so we don't actually know what's being um, discussed in, in the courtroom, um, but also torture um, and um, Ill problematic, horrific treatment within the prisons. Um, I think I are, are really increasing um, and exacerbated uh, the result of, of the war. Um, and on the other hand, and I'm gonna stop after that, um, the, the treatment of ethnic minorities um, in, in Belarus um, seems to become more and more radical and um, problematic. Um, for instance, when uh, beginning in September, all schools of um, ethnic minorities are supposed to conduct their teaching in either Russian or Belarusian, but not in, in um, Latvian or Polish, for instance. Um, so I think there's also um, a, a cultural push toward unifying the nation again, um, um, but in, in a way that uh, would not have been supported by members of the protest movements in 2020, um, which I think had, had, very, had a great potential to undermine this very mono-ethnic uh, nationalism. Um, and the Russification um, of Belarus. So in some ways, I think the election crackdown uh, in 2020 um, was perhaps a precursor to this war and actually laid the foundation for uh, Belarusians' position um, in, in this war um, as a staging ground for uh, the Russian uh, military. Um, and I think it remains to be seen what um, how, how it's going to play out uh, within Belarus in the next uh, few months. Um, but one thing we should also not forget is that, of course, the war and this um, increasing, um, re increasingly repressive climate in Belarus will make it much, much more unlikely, if not impossible, for the thousands of people who have left Belarus since 2020 to return in the near future. Um, and so I think the um, position of the diaspora uh, in Germany and in other European countries um, will be one that um, is going to stay. And I think that's, that's an important moment uh, for our discussion in terms of what, we, what can we as scholars uh, actually do to um, address this war and to understand this war. Okay, and I will... Uh... I agree with pretty well everything that uh, Annika just said. And I think he was very thorough. Um, so I'll focus just on a, on a couple of recent things that got me thinking really about um, the future of Belarus um, after the war ends, assuming that the war ends anytime soon, of course. And I'd like to make reference to a couple of, couple of uh, things. The first is um, Mackey, Foreign Minister Mackey's letter to the 
uh, Europeans, um, trying to reopen links despite the sanctions. And he got a response, and the response was that there would be communication again with Belarus if certain things were, were in place. So first is the release of all political prisoners, followed by new elections that are free and fair, and the removal of all Russian troops from Belarusian territory. And if I recall correctly, it didn't say anything about Russian bases in Belarus. It talked about Russian troops on Belarusian territory. And that seemed to me uh, to suggest that Belarus would, if that happened, have to go back to neutrality and, and sort of some form of non-alignment rather than being directly associated with Russia. And the questions are, if Putin should remain president of Russia, is there any hope for a government in Belarus based on free elections to actually survive? Would Russia permit this to happen? I mean, I think at the moment it looks unlikely. And the other point comes from a comment made by Zyanan Pazniak recently. And Pazniak is not someone who's really noted for his diplomacy, but he made a comment that um, Sikhanovskaya was an openly pro-Russian politician and that she'd shown this during the election campaign of 2020. And thinking back to that campaign, I suppose you could say that the demonstrations that took place, well, actually not the demonstration, the election campaign itself of Sikhanovskaya and her two partners took a very neutral view toward Russia. It wasn't openly pro-Russian, but most of her speeches were in Russian. It was a generally Russophone environment that was created. And you could also say that the original candidates, two of the original candidates for election, um, that is Babarika and especially Sapkala, were quite clearly pro-Russian in direction, even though they were offering a more democratic potential for Belarus. So, and yet after Zikhanovskaya was exiled, her focus was mainly on European capitals and she became much more associated with a pro-Western direction than had been the case during her actual election campaign. So for me, the, the big question is really where, where would Belarus actually go? Is there a place to go if it opposes the Russian line? And if there is, would the Europeans openly accept Belarus, let's say, as, a, as an associate member of the EU, which I guess is a logical conclusion to the, to the European partnership project, or even a full European Union member? Because it seems to me the problem for Belarus is that its options have been limited by its geostrategic position as a neighbor of Russia, and a population of about nine and a half million that can't really expect to oppose anything that Russia demands if it's going to be backed up by force. And it, with Putin in power, I think it's likely to continue. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you for very detailed replies. Uh, dear listeners, you can ask your questions in the chart. We still have some time. I have still one more question, and then we'll turn to your questions. You have this opportunity to um, to ask and uh, to get the replies. So we are all historians. Uh, we work in the field of those in history. I have a sort of first personal uh, question. What does this war mean for historians, for those who work with the history of Belarus? Will the war change anything? Or should it change anything for us, for historians? This is a question to all panelists. Well, for, for the historians, yeah, we see everything that is happening. We are in the process. Um, 
and we understand this process. It's not that this war started all of a sudden, uh, and all, of course, we uh, look at what is happening through the analysis glasses, um, through the point of view of evolution, through the point of view uh, of how the uh, events evolved, even taking into account that Putin's words, uh, he had some lectures uh, before uh, he recognized the uh, independence of the uh, uh, LNR and the NAR. He was speaking about the war, the reason for war, uh, and uh, how sort of uh, fair borders in uh, the 18th century. So naturally, of course, we understand it very well uh, that what is happening is the uh, result of the historical process of the way the Ukrainian nation was formed and how the Belarusian nation was formed, uh, how the national movements and uh, uh, fight for independence were evolving. It is also the result of the historic relations between the nations. It's the consequence of the Soviet uh, um, experience and Soviet heritage. And um, it's also the consequence of uh, uh, the independence, how it appeared in the beginning of the 90s and uh, how it evolved in different countries that uh, appeared after the Soviet Union collapsed. Of course, we are interested in that. We see the process, and for us as historians, it is um, important uh, to see the, uh, the uh, to, to see the evolution and to see the, the uh, parties. Uh, again, we go back to the Russian Empire in different reincarnations, and it, uh, the, the Russian Empire, the uh, USSR, and how it evolves and uh, what what are the consequences, what are the processes. That's all very interesting for us to observe. We'll also think about the future, about what we can expect. It is very important for historians. This period uh, started from the year 2020. I think what we have now is the continuation of what we had in 2020. Uh, for, for us, it, it all uh, makes uh, part of the same party. Um, so um, it, it will mark new books and new parts of history. We will think about it. We will think it over for many years. Now we, uh, yeah, we, we, we will have to, we will write about books about this period. If we speak about Belarus, uh, we'll write about the formation of the Belarusian nation, uh, how it uh, for how how it uh, appeared uh, unexpectedly for the whole world, even for some Belarusians, not all, but for some Belarusians, it was a surprise. Um, I think thinking about challenges for historians or but. I think also other scholars studying uh, Belarus. Um, I think there, there's four points that, that I was thinking about um, today as I was um, preparing for, for this event. Uh, one of them is, of course, logistical. Um, I personally have not been able to travel to Belarus since 2019. Um, and I think most of um, people from abroad have not been able to travel uh, first due to the pandemic, uh, then because of the political crisis in, in, in the preparation of and the aftermath of the election protests. Um, and now with the war, I think it's um, more or less impossible to, to enter the country um, and conduct uh, research there. Um, secondly, I think uh, we have to be worried about uh, the inaccessibility of uh, the infrastructure, so to speak, that, that we historians need, which is archives um, that are hard to um, access um, if you're not physically uh, in, in Belarus. Um, but I'm also thinking here about um, what might, one might call the kind of non-state uh, or unofficial archives that have been created by local activists, um, by regional local historians, 
um, that are of, of such central importance for, for much of the work that many of us have been doing. Um, and, and last but not least, of course, also the um, difficulty that local scholars and historians um, experience, um, especially if they um, are working to create a historical narrative uh, that is um, not in line uh, with, uh, with the party line, so to speak, with, with what the government uh, wants to promote as Belarusian history, uh, that they, they, the exchange with um, the, these crucial experts um, is um, hampered, um, with the exception of those who have been able to emigrate and have been able to uh, get a foot on the ground somewhere else. Um, it's, it's gotten more complicated and more difficult to, to be in touch with colleagues and exchange ideas and discuss interpretations um, and so forth. Um, the third point um, I'm thinking about here, and this is because of my work, uh, which really focuses on uh, the experience um, of uh, the German occupation and the Holocaust in Belarus, um, is of course how this history, this historical experience um, has been weaponized um, and has been uh, reinterpreted and abused um, by the Belarusian government um, since 2020 to uh, denounce um, essentially the, the oppositional and the protest movement um, and creating a whole apparatus of, of inquiry that tries to prove uh, the genocide of the Belarusian population. Um, and without answering that question now, um, I think that um, that very process of trying to prove uh, a genocide in the name of a political agenda um, limits um, what we would call academic freedom. It limits the opportunity to conduct research uh, with an open mind um, and with, with open questions. Um, but of course, um, and, and here I'm referring to a discussion that we had last year informally over Zoom with other colleagues, but also during a symposium earlier this year here at the Mokertes Kolleg in Jena, uh, where we talked about how the, the very um, so-called research that is currently conducted by um, the uh, prosecutor, the general prosecutor, impacts our ability to use archival material because some of it has been seized and this is being monopolized for, for the state-run inquiries. Um, but also interviews uh, that have been conducted with survivors of the war, um, heavily traumatizing them in the process, uh, which will make it very, very difficult for, for researchers um, to go out into the field in Belarus again um, and conduct um, interviews. Uh, where be because I, I mean, personally, I've, I've done a lot of oral history, oral history interviews. Um, I can imagine that many of these elderly um, citizens are really worried to say the wrong thing or um, at all speaking to a foreigner, for instance, who would come and ask questions about the past, because they are aware um, that um, the politics of history are so central for uh, the current government. Um, and then last but not least, and that's again something that really grows out of my own work, um, is that <clears throat> which again focuses on the legacies of um, and the trauma um, experienced by the Belarusian population, by the Jewish population of Belarus, uh, by Roma um, who have been persecuted under, during the German occupation, um, is that this trauma, which um, so far has been very central for our investigation of history uh, and of the politics of memory and of modes of commemoration in Belarus, um, that they might be overshadowed overshadowed by this new trauma uh, that we see on screen every day coming out of Ukraine right now, um, and which, which I think has the capacity to, if not stand side by side, really overshadow um, what we have been discussing when we talked about war and genocide in um, those formerly uh, German occupied territories. Um, and that is a question, I mean, I, I don't have an answer to that, what that means. Um, but it is something that I think several scholars have already articulated um, as something that we will have to grapple with um, as historians who are writing about a recent past of violence uh, that we're now confronting essentially history that repeats forms of violence that we have seen in the past and where we always thought that this is not possible again because of um, the experience of World War II. Um, so these are the four points that I wanted to make. Yeah, to add to, add to that, um, I mean, I would say, first of all, it was not easy to do 
historical research in Belarus before the war broke out. And as you know, the KGB archives have been closed since 1994. So what we are able to look at is basically the national archives and Sonica said local archives uh, in her case. Um, and it's been difficult to do projects. I, I did a project a few years ago about historical memory and Second World War. And um, this, of course, is very much in, in line with where the Belarusian government is today. And it's never really moved away from that. It's simply intensified it, I think, in, in recent times. And then more recently, I've been working with um, Veronika Laputska, who is a Belarusian scholar now based in Poland, um, on the, the sort of 1930s period and NKVD massacres in, in Belarus, which is becoming increasingly exposed by you know, mass graves appearing in various locations. And we started actually quite well, I think. I mean, we published a, maybe three articles now on, on this topic, and then suddenly that was the end. And the last visit I made also was September 2019. And I actually was on, um, not sabbatical leave, but uh, administrative leave from my position in the department. In other words, I got a year off to do research. And it started well, you know, with this research trip to Belarus, but the second one was then canceled because of uh, the pandemic. And I've never been managed to get back again. And, and neither has she, because she's in a position now where she's trying to get her parents out of, out of Belarus. And um, really uh, not no prospect of going back. And I think there's a lot of Belarusian graduate students in that same position that they cannot really go back home. Uh, some of them have chosen to focus on other topics. Um, some, in some cases, Ukraine, which actually has now also become problematic in that you can't go to Ukraine. Um, I have a PhD student who was supposed to spend this coming summer in Zaporizhia. I mean, his entire project has had to be abandoned because of the war. So it's certainly going to make things difficult. And I agree with Annika completely that this war will change the way we think about the great patriotic war. I think it's bound to do because in that narrative, which started in Moscow, but there's a sort of version of it in, in Minsk as well, you're talking about the liberation of a population from so-called you know, Nazi plague, as it's usually described and according to official propaganda then the fact that we have democracy today in western europe is a result of the soviet liberation of occupied eastern europe and that narrative i think will now be strongly questioned and it may undermine that the narratives in in belarus as well and she's been unidimensional and it's also managed to undermine the opposition in various ways, I think, because of their association, collaboration, um, use of the white, red, white flag and things like that, which then reemerge in later times. And that's been exploited by the, by the regime quite effectively, I think. So it is going to be difficult and we may be reduced to things like interviews and, and I agree, uh, alternative re resources may be in the West. I know in London, there's quite a, a good library um, the Skarina Library in North London. Uh, we've got one or two in North America as well. But it's going to be like Soviet Union times where researchers from the West couldn't actually go into Soviet archives um, in the Soviet period. And Annika, you're probably too young to have experienced that. Um, but it happened in my case while I was doing my PhD that it was impossible to actually get inside the country when I first started. And um, that's really where, where we are, I think, in, in the West today. We have to think of other ways around that. And perhaps, as Thomas suggested at the very beginning, work on a more local social level rather than try and focus on what the authorities are doing. And maybe even do microcosmic studies of, of various villages and their experience rather than trying to look on the broader perspective of, of Belarus as a whole. I don't think it will stop um, at any point. I mean, I think historians will always continue to work, but it certainly brought about new questions that some of which were unfathomable before, 
but some of which were not altogether unfamiliar either. So I will stop at that point. Thank you. And uh, here, well, there is a number of questions. And uh, uh, well, uh, there were uh, questions: uh, what to do, what historians can do uh, uh, during the war, uh, what the historians uh, uh, write about the current events, can they uh, uh, have interviews, uh, uh, gather materials uh, through oral history, for example? Uh, what is, in your opinion, I think that in any situation, any any uh, per engaged person. Uh, well, uh, historians or uh, citizens of Belarus uh, uh, should do what is within their potential to do. There are opportunities, uh, for example, well, uh, to do something, to do at least uh, something to support uh, support with your financial means, or uh, by do some uh, individual action. But for historians, now is difficult. In Belarus now, in a, in, uh, there is no independent uh, historic history research. There is no space for such research in Belarus uh, because of the, everything that is happening now. Well, well, it, 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 even printing uh, opportunities are much narrower and it's impossible to publish books in Belarus. So repressions go against uh, those entities or um, uh, those teams of uh, uh, universities. Oh, uh, so the uh, repressions have not reached uh, all the uh, departments, let's say, there some people uh, uh, one wouldn't say that uh, there are only those who support this uh, regime and uh, are ready to uh, act in the uh, uh, same uh, way that uh, the authorities expect. Expect So we uh, have the research on genocide from the point of view of political requirements. But well, uh, well those who left, uh, they uh, they have challenges uh, where to find uh, uh, find opportunities to continue to be in the profession, to find employment, to support their to look uh, well to to uh, maintain and uh, fulfill their uh, research activities, and also to look for uh, understanding and support from uh, Western countries from Western partners, those who, uh, well, uh, especially for those who left, well, there should be an understanding that what is happening now in Belarus, uh, well, uh, affects uh, very importantly the uh, historiography, historical science. Uh, and those people who treat, uh, who are uh, dealing with oral history, the archives of oral his history archives, those uh, who uh, are engaged in this project, they continue to uh, interview people. They uh, try to um, be in touch with those people who uh, left, who were engaged in 2020, even if it's very hard. And, and there is a huge, uh, uh, uncertainty um, uh, before us, and there are uh, both optimistic and uh, pessimistic uh, anti anticip anticipations, but uh, everybody should do, uh, well, uh, I mean the Belarusian historians uh, should do what they are uh, supposed to do, and also for uh, artists, for all people from uh, this community. Well, what the uh, well, what the foreign uh, historians uh, should do. Well, maybe my, my colleagues would uh, uh, share their opinions on, on that. Well, I'll, I'll try. Um, I think I would I would like to think here about historian scholars um, in two ways. Um, one of them would be as kind of citizen scholars, um, as members of their own community, um, as as people um, who I think have um, an, a strong incentive to organize. Uh, a number of ways to support people who are fleeing from the war, um, who have lost their livelihoods as a result of repression. Um, and there are a number of initiatives 
um, to organize those those kinds of support in the in the form of um, let's say fellowships, stipends, uh, and so forth uh, for for our colleagues um, from from Belarus, for instance, who've lost their jobs. Um, and who have uh, no chance of um, being hired as historians again, or find any jobs. We, we know of a number of them who have trouble finding any kind of employment um, because of the uh, involvement of the KGB, who basically shuts down any kind of employment opportunities. Um, and so there are a number of initiatives um, <clears throat> that, that, that I think we all know, and we can share some of that in the chat. Um, together with um, some of the people who are actually on in the audience here, Felix Ackerman, for instance, I see um, we've just um, issued a call to German foundations um, and institutions of higher education uh, to do more to support Ukrainian um, scholars, um, especially those who actually cannot leave Ukraine um, and who are in no position to conduct any kind of scholarship right now, um, but who need um, basic support in terms of organizing their livelihood, um, but also to think about um, ways of support for, again, our Belarusian co colleagues or colleagues from Russia who um, are targeted by repression by the state. Um, so I think there's a responsibility of, uh, for us as, as scholars, as professionals, uh, to take care of our colleagues. Um, from a scholarly perspective, I think there's a number of ways that we can do. One of them is <clears throat> to create an archive. I mean, I think that's where, where historical research always starts, is to create an archive. Um, and that starts with uh, collecting media reports, that um, collecting sources that are being produced every day in front of our eyes. Um, we know of some initiatives already to interview people who are di directly impacted uh, and affected by the war. Um, and I think uh, that also opens up an opportunity um, when we're thinking specifically about Belarus, um, as long as we are able to maintain connections with our colleagues in Belarus, um, to think about collaborative work, to think about how we can collaborate um, in conducting some of the research um, in, in, in a situation where <clears throat> archives are inaccessible um, for, for, for us and for our colleagues in Belarus as well. Um, but how can we document what is actually happening right now? I think there is, at some point, this is going to be history. Um, so I think uh, historians often think about history as something that's long past, um, but this, this is the history of the present. Um, and, and I think we uh, can start to think about that already very carefully um, at this very moment. Yeah, I, I, I agree with most of that. And I think, um... You know, I just got a, a call from a, a, an email from an editor in New York and uh, Timothy Snyder has just published a new version of Bloodlands and I was asked if I wanted a complimentary copy and um, he's already managed to include the war in Ukraine as a sort of epilogue to his Bloodlands. I mean, that, that's perhaps a little bit uh, premature, you know, given where we are right now with the war, but uh, it just shows that it is possible to do that, to um, to include the present war. And I would go back further and say, in Belarus case, uh, to explain 2020, I mean, I know there's been a lot of discussion, there have been a lot of articles and some publications already on how Belarus got to that particular stage, where that, what was it, 200,000 people in Minsk at the peak, where did they come from? You know, how could that suddenly have happened in Belarus of all places? And th this, probably needs some historical perspective. It cannot, be, it cannot be explained simply by the circumstances of 2020. You've got to go back further. And I think the whole independent era, therefore might, and perhaps even the Soviet era to some extent might, might fall under that same, um, might fall under that same study. But I think in terms of um, helping out scholars, um, well, in, in Canada, it's fairly straightforward now. I mean, our granting agencies are giving out very large grants and they prefer to give bigger grants over long periods now than smaller ones over a year, say. They would prefer to see a five-year study, give $2 million and you could spend it how you wish. But if it's got a focus on the war in Ukraine in any aspect, my guess is it would be looked on quite favorably. And Belarus, like it or not, is part of this war. And I think in terms of Belarusian studies, it can be incorporated. 
into these studies of Ukraine. So they've been more of a regional study than a study of just one state. And in that way, you could bring in a lot of scholars. And I think probably you have to look at two levels, the, the academics in Belarus and also the graduate students. And although I don't know the exact numbers, there must be thousands of Belarusian graduate students who are now at Western institutions and particularly in Poland, Lithuania, and I imagine the Czech Republic as well, but certainly in that part of Europe. And these are the ones who would probably struggle once they complete their dissertations as well. I mean, where are they gonna go? The chances to go back to, to Belarus right now are fairly minimal. And that may be the case for the next 10 years, which is the early part of those, those careers. So it's necessary really to, to nurture this coming group of scholars who are working in the area and all have very different projects. They might be on language, they might be on ethnicity, they might be on gender, they might be on history, they might be on political science, but they should all be treated in the same kind of fashion. So it's a chance, I think, for the Western world to show a little bit more largesse towards the world where the war is being fought and where the situation has become simply impossible. And we may even look on it as a sort of refugee issue as well. Uh, in Ukraine, I read today, there may be as many as 11 million refugees eventually leaving Ukraine out of a population of, of 45 million before the war started. And in Belarus over the past two years, you've seen the same problem, just masses and masses of people leaving and no real prospect of going back again. And um, this has created a, a new diaspora in both cases. So I think that's where we are as far as Western concept, scholars are concerned. On a personal level, um, I think it's actually easier now to look at topics, for me at least, which are more contemporary than it is to look at historical ones where you would need archives. And that's just a personal, personal thing. I mean, I've often looked at political science alongside history and I'm quite comfortable in that era. But I know for historians, it is, it is really quite problematic now. So I realize we're running out of time and we wanna get more questions in. So I will shut up. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, more or less 10, we have more or less 10 minutes. We have questions, uh, so please, short questions. First question is personally to Annika. It uh, concerns the pro-Russian forces in uh, Germany. What are these people? What is their motivation? Uh, who are those people who support uh, Putin and why and uh, how important they are? Um, that's, of course, a big question and a question that could lead to a long uh, conversation. Uh, so I'm going to try to keep it um, short. Um, I think, um, for one, I think we need to think about uh, a large um, community of, of immigrants from Russia who have um, settled in, in Russia and in Russia and Germany in, in recent years, um, who've been very vocal. I think we all have um, read about the um, rallies uh, in Berlin and other um, cities in support of the war. Um, on the other hand, of course, if, if you think about um, the German population, um, German born uh, population, I think there is a large contingent um, of people, um, including scholars, politicians, who have for a long time taken seriously the mandate that really came out of World War II uh, to, to try to build a friendly relationship uh, with uh, Russia. Um, as the uh, successor state of the Soviet Union. Um, and, and to some extent, I would identify myself as such. I was socialized in, in this environment um, where uh, building bridges uh, with Russia was um, most what you were doing because as, as a lesson of, of World War II. Um, and I think to, to some extent, uh, for, for many people among this, um, this population, um, that has led to a perhaps somewhat uncritical or less aware view of, of Russia um, and, and what happened uh, within Russia in, 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 in recent years, um, where you could see tendencies toward an increasingly autocratic and repressive uh, regime. 
um, which has now um, taken uh, to, to war. Um, so I think there's, there's a long history to um, the support uh, for Russia. Um, and, and I think we have to think here about uh, the, the aftermath and the legacies of World War II. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is just, just a very, very broad uh, picture, but I really wanna leave some, some, some time for the other questions. Um, but of course, there's, there's also, um, I think there's, there's neo-Nazis um, who are um, supportive um, of, of Putin's um, strategy uh, to recreate um, a, a Russian empire under a nationalist um, si signage. Um, there, I think there's a variety of groups um, that are um, uncritically um, supporting Russia, or maybe even because of what of what the Russian government is currently doing. Um, so I don't think there is a, a one answer um, to that big question. Thank you very much. The next question is from uh, Belarus. It is Belarusian made about the resources of the Lukashenko's regime uh, to uh, maintain the economy uh, in the face of sanctions, uh, while well, to support, to maintain the economy, to avoid the collapse of the economy. And if there is a collapse, of the economic collapse, there would be new protests. So what is your, uh, what is, how do you view this? Uh, this? So this question should be asked uh, to uh, uh, economists. What are the economic educators? But uh, generally talking, so one should not, 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 not be a, a great expert to understand that under sanctions, uh, in these conditions, uh, uh, when the main donor of the Belarusian economy is getting poor, so uh, there would be less money, less resources, and it would imp impact the general cost of living, and the situation will become worse. Well, uh, but the issue is, whether it would be a new trigger that would uh, um, strengthen the protest potential. Yes, I think to some extent it will necessarily strengthen the protest potential, especially if there are some uh, uh, troubles in Belarus. Uh, when it in, uh, uh, when the political crisis uh, is uh, supported is uh, has uh, it is uh, uh, background as economic growth so uh, the issue well what uh, uh, whether there is a direct relationship so people get uh, poor and would they uh, protest well the outcome might be different well, sometimes it uh, pushes to some discontent sometimes not we know that there were many countries that are not very rich and, and the regime does not uh, do not change in these countries. Well, and the regimes stay. So in our conditions, I think at least there should be three factors. So political uh, situation, should uh, change. So the uh, protest potential that was accumulated that uh, showed up in 2020, uh, which is still there uh, among many people. So the worsening of the economic situation, and of course, and the international context, uh, so everything that uh, is happening around Belarus and uh, related to Belarus. So these three uh, factors, so when they uh, go together, uh, we might have interesting uh, events in Belarus that might lead to a more uh, happy end. Uh, but the uh, eco economy surely has an impact, but cannot be a decisive factor. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will try to uh, uh, to uh, go with uh, the uh, last question. Uh, well, so the historic, uh, historical policy of the Lukashenko regime and the concept of the genocide of the Belarusian people. So uh, from the 2020 perspective, uh, is it the same line uh, uh, with what we see how the war is being, uh, the war of Russia and Ukraine is being presented? Uh, it is the same. Well, I think that here, the history, uh, historical policy of Lukashenko's regime 
is not projected to history, but to the uh, to nowadays, to the contemporary political needs to have something, some uh, historical uh, underpinning or um, uh, justification of steps taken by Lukashenko. So, uh, so uh, there were no historic policy, uh, let's say coherent historic policy for the, of the regime, but now at this field, taking in account that uh, Lukashenko uh, is in a kind of vacuum, uh, and now they use what is uh, uh, close to them, understandable to them. So they uh, use this uh, topic of the uh, war uh, time. He takes the genocide and develops it. At the same time, he uh, uh, points out uh, to the uh, current events. And this is a pure instrumentalization of the history and uh, also discredits, uh, discredits uh, not only the internal opponents, but all, all those, uh, well, the external world saying, look what they were doing against the Belarusians, the, uh, the West. So these are, uh, well, all issues are used to, to use, uh, uh, instrumentalize uh, the history for the current political issues. Dear colleagues, many thanks for your discussion for your participation. These are very hard times for historians and for uh, the society. At these times, we can only um, hope that uh, there would be a miracle. I hope that this miracle uh, would be in a form of Ukraine's victory in this war against Russia. And the, here we should understand one thing. If Ukraine wins, Belarus will win and everybody, all us will win. So we'll great hope on the Ukrainian victory, Ukraine's victory. I would like to end our discussion. Uh, thank you very much.